Thanks, Karen. Welcome everyone to our joint lab. Uh, we're all joining you guys from coast to coast. I'm on the West Coast. We have Franco in Chicago. We have Rafi on the East Coast. And Max, you said you're in Amsterdam? Right now in Amsterdam, yeah. Amazing. Yeah. So we are all over and please, as Karen said, feel free to chime in and tell us where you're from and ask any questions. This is a informal event. Um, and as the title is, title says, this is around scaling and automating R using Databricks. So a, a few minutes ago, Max and Rafi gave a quick intro on themselves, but just again, uh, let's, let's introduce ourselves. Um, I'm a solutions architect here at Databricks. Um, I, I learned R back in college, but have not done a thing with it. So I'm really excited to be on this call and, and learn, some, learn some more stuff on how we can scale it. Um, how about you, Franco? Hey, everyone. My name is Franco Patano. I'm a solutions architect here with Databricks. I do live in the Chicagoland area. Um, I've been with Databricks for a little bit over two years now. Um, and my background is data warehousing and BI. And now I help customers figure out what this lake house thing is and help them be successful. And I work with other awesome people in the field like uh, Max and Rafi here. Max, do you want to introduce yourself? Um, yeah, hey guys, so uh, as I already said previously, um, yeah, my name is Max. I'm a resident solutions architect at Databricks. So um, basically I'm a post sales equivalent to Lee and Franco. So I really help a lot of large clients uh, be successful uh, in scaling their, um, you know, big data workloads using R, but also using Python and uh, yeah, most importantly using Spark. Um, uh, I'm originally uh, from Amsterdam. Currently, I've just been based in London. And uh, yeah, from next week, I'll be actually living in Singapore. Nice. I guess I'll go next. So yeah, I'm, I'm Rafi Kralancic. I'm uh, another solutions architect here at Databricks. And I actually work in the uh, mid-market commercial segment here. So I work with a lot of startups and uh, mid-sized companies, which is very exciting because we get to see a lot of interesting use cases. Um, I think that's something that's a little different about it. And uh, I've been at Databricks for about two years. I learned programming from the Johns Hopkins Data Science Specialization. So everything I've, uh, which is taught in R. So everything subsequently, including Databricks, I, I've kind of dove headfirst in with, uh, with R. So excited to share some of the things that uh, we've learned over the past couple of years with you all today. Nice. I, I always get that question of how can I transition into this world? So it's awesome to hear that you started, you know, by doing an online course and, and getting 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 here that way. Yeah. 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 No, go ahead, Max. Yeah, no, I just want to vouch for that as well. So uh, when I started my career, it was mostly using Excel and SQL in my day-to-day -day job. And then by doing a, a data camp course online, I got into R and Python more and more and could actually you know, implemented more and more into my job as I went along. And that was a pretty good way of doing it. So quite similar to Rafi, I think, yeah. Yeah, I, I definitely want to chime in just to briefly with, with my story here. I actually didn't know programming at all and I wasn't working as a data analyst at all, but my uh, my industry was being taken over by machine learning. So I kind of saw the, the writing on the wall. And uh, I think a lot of these, there's so many different uh, resources that you can use online to learn how to program. The key is just like picking one and actually doing it and like really applying yourself to it. And then uh, we need more people who have these skills. So, uh, so yeah, definitely if you're interested in it, don't be afraid of it, just go do it and good things will happen. That's awesome. I actually have a very similar background. Uh, I was dabbling in Excel in the early days, you know, as a lot of us users were um, and getting frustrated with its ability to calculate sitting there at my, at my laptop desktop just watching the progress bar calculate, calculating, calculating. And I, I remember when I first experienced, I eventually went on to learn like SQL and then kind of mess around in the, micro, the MSBI stack with SQL Server and reporting services. Eventually I started hitting a wall of performance, right? And I remember the first time I experienced Spark SQL on Databricks, I was like, oh, it wasn't calculating for an hour. This is great. Like, where do I sign up? <laughs> so I completely agree, like no matter where you come from, no matter what tools that you learned to start with, if it's R, Python, Excel, SQL, uh, you know, you can use those skills in this world and we need help. There's organizations all over the globe, you know, Max, you heard from Max, Max is going to Singapore because that's where the opportunity is. And he is in Europe right now. We're over here in, in the Americas, right? Doing the same thing. It's a global thing. So definitely uh, get in. 
Yeah. Absolutely. Good plugs around all of that. So let's, I mean, we have a lot of content, so let's, let's dive right in. Take it away guys. Um, yeah, great. So uh, let me just uh, share my screen. Uh, yeah. There will be one second. Yeah, while, while you're doing that, I'll, I'll just give like a, a high level agenda of what we wanted to walk through. We wanted to show you um, as our users, like what it would look like just to use R on Databricks, you know, without Spark, without any new stuff, without any new technologies, just, just what it looks like to use R. And then we'll talk about Apache Spark and, and how R fits in there. And then we'll kind of end off um, with um, some, uh, some ML flow and, and talking a little bit about automation. Yep. Cool. Thanks, Rafi. Yeah, so I'll just talk a bit about, um, you know, we're using R in Databricks and maybe more broadly speaking, how you can really use R in the cloud and why you should really do that, right? So I think straight off the bat, one of the main benefits of going to the cloud with uh, things like R, but also with things like Python, is that you can really just choose on the fly how much compute you want, right? Or how much storage you want. So maybe you start with a small computer with uh, you know, a little bit of RAM, and then it turns out, well, your data set no longer fits in it. And then you know, using something like Azure or Google Cloud Platform or um, AWS, you can just easily, with the click of a button, you know, increase the compute that you want, right, for your workloads. Well, when you're doing this on your local machine or when you're on premise, this tends to be a lot more challenging. Um, and the same goes for storage, right? If you need more storage to store more data of more of your enterprise data, then it's really quite easy to just, you know, add more storage to your cloud platform. Um, and Databricks really helps with this, right? So this is uh, the notebook that you see here in the screen is what we call the Databricks Unified Analytics Platform. And it's really just this place where you have compute and storage and this notebook environment all in one place so that you can really be as productive as possible. Um, and so it comes with all kinds of benefits, right? So it's really easy to attach more compute to your Databricks uh, notebook that you can see here on the left where I just have attached my compute cluster that I'm going to run my commands on. Um, it's very easy to interact with, you know, the cloud storage. So for example, ADLS Gen 2 or something like an S3 bucket. Um, but lastly, it's also very uh, easy to do things like DevOps with it, right? So Databricks has integrations with things like Azure DevOps, GitHub. So you can very easily develop your code and then easily deploy it to some sort of production environment that lives on your cloud as well. So these are really just a handful of the benefits. Um, and now what I first want to show you is, so what if you're hey, just an, yeah. Hey, Max, just before you start going to uh, the code examples, I, I did want to share sure. one, one anecdote um, yeah. So when my, my first job uh, working in, in data analytics was as a, a business analyst in the uh, healthcare system here in South, South New Jersey. And I was working in our, I was the first person that they had doing any kind of predictive analytics. Um, and my laptop had eight, gig, eight gigabytes of RAM. And uh, it, it became very clear very quickly that uh, you know I could I could spend a lot of time reading articles on the internet while my code was running, or I could ask them to give me a bigger laptop. And so I did that. And you know the IT guys, I remember them walking down the hall, coming to my desk, picking up the laptop, being like, "All right, um, I guess you can just use you know you can go home, I guess." And uh, <laughs> and then taking it away, and then coming back the next day, and you know they had physically added more RAM to my laptop, up to sixteen. I think it was sixteen. So on Databricks, this is like trivial. This is like super trivial to be able to just say, hey, you know what? Like I'm running out of memory with with R. Let me just provision more. Let me get more. And Databricks will automatically turn this off for you uh, after after two hours by default. So. Um, so yeah, just wanted just wanted to to share like the experience of, of an R user working on your laptop in you know for your company it, it can be uh, much easier to to get access to the compute that you need to Max's point. I like that story I a think, lot. I was gonna say yeah. one other one other point. Um, Max called out some of the the big points like you know the ability to like uh, separate compute from from your work um, and then also just tying into some of the object store you know open source or open object stores out there but if you jump back to the notebook i see in the top there you know in spirit of collaboration data collab lab the top right there you see that a couple users are actually collaborating in this notebook at the same time those are little icons right 
Um, I think that's awesome about you about this world. Okay, they just they just turned on to you know colorful. So this is one place we can all work together, like Google Docs style. Yeah, definitely. Exactly. <clears throat> Yeah, and um, I just want to address the point, right, of uh, what Rafi said, just how easy it is to create a cluster. So I just went to the cluster tab. You can just create a new cluster like here, Max. And um, I just have to put away this thing. And here on the bottom right, we can just say, well, I just want a cluster of maybe minus the, uh, with 10 workers, and then we can also scale it to 20 workers. And if that's not big enough, then you can go even uh, bigger later on, or you can go smaller if you think you don't use your cluster enough. So it's really easy to just be, you know, changing the amount of compute that you need on the fly. Um, cool, so yeah, let's get started with our first example. So the first thing I wanted to show you guys is, um, well, a lot of our users are probably used to, you know, running our workloads on their local machine. And I just want to quickly show you what it looks like to just run a basic uh, data processing workload on R. So I think um, many of the R users that will, that are online with us today are uh, have used the Tidyverse a lot. So on Databricks, uh, all the Tidyverse library, uh, most noticeably deep by R, they all just come readily available with your cluster. So in command three, you can just see that I'm just doing library deep by R. I didn't have to install it, it was just available. And what I'm now going to do is I'm going to read an airline's data set from, um, yeah, from a CSV file that lives on the storage, which, is, which happens to be on S3 because we're on an Amazon uh, workspace. So I think all these commands should be really familiar to you. So we're just reading in the CSV file into DeployR. And in a notebook, you can just immediately um, show the output of these data frames right in the cell, right? So I'm just doing the head command here and then we can easily inspect our data set. And yeah. what I'm then doing, sorry? I was saying that the key thing here is that this behaves exactly as you would expect with R on, on your laptop or R Studio. It's the exact same behavior. Yeah, exactly. So this is uh, exactly the same as running on the uh, single computer on your local machine and the experience should be quite similar. Um, so what we're showing here in command five is this is, would be a really typical, um, yeah, data wrangling kind of job that you can do with the R, right? So what we're doing here on our uh, airlines data set is we're just taking our data frame that we just read in with our CSV file. We just apply a simple filter on it. So we're just saying we take the data that's only associated with January. And then we're just going to cal uh, calculate a, a bunch of statistics related to uh, the flights that are in these airlines. So we're going to calculate the total taxi time, which is the taxi time when departing uh, plus the taxi time when arriving. We're going to calculate the average speed. And then we finalized with a group by, right? So we're going to group by the origin and destination airport. And for each trip, we then basically get the average airspeed, the average taxi time and the average delay. Um, and so these are all commands that, yeah, just as easily work on Databricks as um, what you're used to on um, on a local machine. So um, the question was asked in the chat, I just want to make sure everyone understands, we're not using Spark yet. This is just based no. on, we will be getting yeah. to scaling it up, but we're just showing you, you can do what you can today. That's the comment that Rafi made earlier. This is just base R right now. Exactly, yeah. The next steps. But you can do what you do today on Databricks, and we'll talk about our studio as well. Exactly. So just just to briefly call that out, right? Like that's this is how our users often kind of start out on the cloud. So they first would just migrate to workloads that they already have, which are single nodes. They would just move that to the cloud, and once they are comfortable with you know using these workloads on the cloud, that's usually when they would then transition to these more distributed workloads like Spark, which we will talk about uh, in a moment. Um, so one more thing I want to call out before uh, we delve into Spark is the fact that uh, Databricks also supports RStudio. So um, just to briefly show how that would work, so I can just go to my cluster, which will be here. And then I'm going to do my uh, cluster here. And what I can then simply do is I can go to apps and then I can uh, run set up RStudio and this will immediately launch our studio for me, for which I have a tab open here. Wait, what? That's all you have to do? 
to set up our studio you mean it already comes pre-configured in the runtime yeah it does yeah so from databricks runtime seven onwards the machine learning runtime has our studio pre-installed there's nothing you have to do yeah that's awesome that's awesome so is there a specific runtime version that that magic happens with um uh, I anything seven, set, right yeah anything 7.0 ml and up yeah 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 Got it. yeah that's awesome. So, so with Databricks runtime 7.0 and up, you can just run with uh, the, the R Studio on top of it, and it just it configures it for you and installs it, and then you just have to log in. Yep, it's uh, it's R Studio server um, open source, and if you have R Studio Pro like licenses, you can bring that to to Databricks as well. So, and, and we have public public documentation for that. That's awesome. Yep, exactly. So just want to quickly show you our studio, right? So we have exactly the same script. Um, so we read in the CSV files and we do the data wrangling on the airlines uh, data frame. And this would all work exactly like you would expect from your local machine, right? So it's exactly the same environment. So we have our, our scripts on the top left. We have our variables, our data on the top right. And then here on the bottom right, you can interact with your, for example, your GG plots, your packages, as well as your files. So um, if you're really a diehard R Studio user, then um, yeah, this then Databricks may be the perfect cloud environment for you. Um, so this is one thing I wanted to call out. So as we now saw, when we read in this CSV file, it actually took us one minute. This uh, CSV file was about 600 megabytes. And that's about the size that can just be hand handled by one single node, right? But what now if you have a data set that's maybe you know six gigabytes or maybe even more? Um, then deep R is no longer gonna cut it, right? So this is then really where Spark will come in. So what does Spark really do under the hood? Um, oh, well, Max, can I can I give a, a brief intro here before we sure. go into the internals? So okay. I, can can you scroll down just a little bit more? Yeah. So we can see the full picture there. Okay, thanks. So uh, the, the way I, I've described R to uh, Spark to many R users in the past is imagine if you have data like Matt, like where Max was just going, right? Like imagine you have data that won't fit in memory on your laptop. So what are you going to do? So you can either go buy a bigger laptop, you can you can call IT and have them walk down the hall, like what happened to me, right? Or uh, and, and that will kind of like terminate in eventually a mainframe. So you have products like Netiza and things like that that are these massive, you know, single supercomputers that that can handle very large amounts of data and process it very quickly. But it's very expensive. Um, there's another way that you can go though, which is essentially you can have many, many small, cheap computers uh, network together and represent your data uh, as if it were one thing, right? And that is, and that's cluster computing, and that's what Spark is. Spark is an in-memory cluster computing engine. So, so uh, now Max, you're you know, you're about to go into this. You can now the, the cluster diagram should hopefully make sense, and and why we have like a driver and master node, uh, master and worker nodes, and things like that. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Rafi. That's uh, that's exactly how it is. So. The way I always picture Spark as well, right? Because um, Spark is quite relatable to how you use R. So with R and deploy R, you use data frames. And with Spark, you actually also use data frames. Mm -hmm. um, the big difference, of course, is that uh, a normal data frame on R, that will all just be local on your own local machine in memory. Whereas a data frame uh, with Spark will actually be distributed over the Spark workers. And so this is why uh, Spark works, right, for large data sets. So for example, if you maybe have 20 gigabytes of data, when you read in this data, what Spark will actually do is we'll just uh, partition this data into smaller bite-sized chunks, say maybe one gigabyte each, that actually do fit on the memory of each of these worker nodes. And on each of these local worker nodes, it will then locally do these computations for you before it brings it back all together to show it to you on the driver. Um, so that's kind of how Spark intuitively uh, works. And that's how it made sense for me. Um, so how do you really get into Spark when you're an R user, and especially when you're a Tidyverse user? So the folks uh, over at um, our studio, they created this great package called SparkClear. And essentially, it's a flavor of Spark uh, that we can use with R. Um, 
And the aim of this package is that you can really use the same API that you're used to with dplyr, but then with Spark. So that's why Sparklear is often a favorite for our users because it, it makes it very easy for, um, yeah, our users who are very much used to dplyr and the other tidyverse libraries to transition towards Spark. So I, oh. I have a question there. I, I'm a big Python user and using pandas data frames and we use koalas in order to scale a pandas data frame. Is this basically the same thing? Yeah. Yeah, I would say so. Yeah, okay. definitely. So Sparklear is basically uh, koalas for our users. Yeah. Nice. That's a good drop-in replacement to get the scalability without even having to think about it. Yeah, and I, I just want to add there that going back to like skills and, and learning new things, I think that the, the, the approach that our studio took towards building this integration with the Tidyverse, it is the easiest on-ramp for our users to begin working with uh, Spark data frames. Uh, I think what Max is about to show, you'll you'll see it'll it'll click like why that is exactly. Yeah. So first of all, what I'm doing is, um, and this is always what you have to do with Spark, is you have to create this uh, entry point, which we call the Spark context. Um, the entry point for Sparklear you would create by using this Spark Connect command, and we then use the Databricks method because well, we're in the Databricks environment. Um, using the Spark context entry point. We can then read in uh, the same CSV that we used in the previous ex example, but then we can read it into a Sparklear data frame. And we do that by using the Sparklear Spark read CSV command. Otherwise, it's quite similar, right? So we then give it, a, um, this is a name that, we, that that's used for the table name under the hood. We then give it the, the path of where the CSV is located. Um, and then we can also predefine what the schema of the data looks like. And this will basically help you speed up the reading of the data. And so what we already see here, right, because this is distributed functionality, is that we actually read in the data in only 26 seconds. Well, with DeepYR, only it, it took a full minute because Derek was only using the driver node. Well, right now we're actually using the full cluster. Um, so now that we have our Sparklear data frame, we now want to do the same data wrangling operations that we were doing previously. And so this is what we see in command 13. And what you should hopefully notice is that the commands that we use here are exactly the same as that we used for deploy R. So we again use the mutate command to generate these new columns to create the total taxi time and create the airspeed per hour. Um, we use the same filter commands as we used for deploy R. We use our group by statement to group by origin and destination. And then we use the summarize method to, um, yeah, to, to summarize of origin and destination and get these average metrics. So just to make sure you understand, this code is exactly the same as we used for deploy R. But this will now actually be uh, executed in a distributed fashion and using the full power of a Databricks cluster. And this really shows you the power of Sparklear, right? So it's it's really easy to then make the transition from deploy R to Sparklear. All you really have to do is that you make sure you read in a data frame using the Sparklear library as opposed to deploy R library. And then you can really use all the existing deploy R functionality to do all your data wrangling. So you can just, it is just like Koalas then, you can just change the, the prefix in Python, it works a little differently. You can just replace the 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 name like import pandas as PD. You could do import koalas as PD, and it's just a drop in replacement. With Sparkly exactly. R, you you have to prefix the spark dot read command with that Sparkly R colon colon, and that's basically what tells it use this library, don't use the default library, and it kind of like overrides where the command goes. Exactly. So, yeah. Yeah. That that's uh, the the double colon is. Um, a way to reference a function in R without having to load the whole package. But uh, but yeah, the main idea is, is exactly like you said, you can have the same exact dplyr code with your pipes and you can just pass in, uh, whether you pass in an R data frame or a Spark data frame read with Sparkly R, it will uh, yield you the same result. So a lot of your um, data, you know, a lot of your data wrangling code, you can repurpose again with, uh, with Sparkly R. There are some limitations to this, but it's still a very, very tight uh, integration. So it's good, something great to, to be aware of how quickly you can get up and running with it. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, how, yeah how are we doing on, on time, by the way? Just curious. Yeah. 
Uh, probably another like 10 to 15 minutes. Okay. Is there, is it the, the ML section we got to cover? Yeah, and uh, just before I want to go there, I'll just spend one more minute on uh, just showing the other API, which is Spark R. But um, yeah, yeah, I'll just cover that quickly, if that's all right. Yeah, go for it. Yeah. Of course. Um, right. So yeah, I just wanted to uh, make you aware of one more API, which is the, the original Spark API created by the original uh, creators of Spark. And this is simply called uh, Spark R. Um, Spark R uses slightly different concepts, but the whole concept of data frames and just chaining these data wrangling methods together is really quite similar to Spark Clear. So changing to Spark R um, is really also not that much of a leap uh, compared to Spark Clear. So what we do here is, again, we do very similar commands in command 16. So we now use the read.df command instead of read CSV from Spark R. And instead, we, but again, we use the same path, but here we now say that the source is a CSV, et cetera, et cetera. Um, otherwise, it's really quite similar. But instead of a Spark Clear data frame, we now have Spark R data frame. Um, if we now want to do some data wrangling, uh, then this is also quite similar, right? But the, there are just quite there are just these small subtle differences between Spark Clear and Spark R. So in Spark R, instead of mutate, you would have with column, in which we declare a new column and then just do the calculations here. Um, but otherwise, you also have group by, right? So just like with dplyr and uh, Spark Clear, you just have group by, where we then say, okay, group by origin and destination. And instead of summarize, we can then just do ag, which is short for aggregate, of course, and then calculate all these aggregate metri metrics. So I just wanted to call this out that um, also the leap to Spark R is really not that big from Deploy R. And what we have found uh, through tests is that Spark R for some workloads tends to be a bit quicker than Sparklier. So it's definitely something to also consider when you're moving to Spark. Um, yeah, and that's really what I wanted to mention uh, regarding the basic API uh, for Spark R and Sparklier. And uh, Rafi will now uh, take us a bit more towards um, about machine learning and user defined functions. Uh, Rafi, shall I just pass on the screen to you? You're on mute, bud. There you go. Yeah, let's do that. I have one question before we jump into it. I know we got a lot of content. Sure. But this is one question out there um, being asked is Are there any scenarios that you wouldn't want to use Sparkly R over Dip? I can't say it. Deploy R? Deployer. <laughs> I call deep it, I say Deployer. Yeah, Everybody I mean, all the terminology, <laughs> like anything in our field, is a lot. So, yeah, are there any scenarios where, you'd, where you wouldn't want to use Sparkly R over Deploy R? Uh, if, I think if you have like a very small data and, and there's, you know, sometimes it, there's no reason to use Spark. Um, so, so yeah, you can you okay. can definitely yeah. If you have small data, just you can stick with R, perfectly fine. You can still reap the benefits of working uh, on Databricks, but uh, yeah, good question. So somebody are asked, uh, what, are there some aspects of dplyr that is not available in Sparkly R? Yeah, so I, I can definitely point that out. There is there is when you want to use mutate and you want to create new columns based on uh, functions. So uh, there's, you, you have to use, there's a limitation to the number of uh, available methods for mutate with Sparkly R. So you, you have to use Hive user defined uh, functions, um, which is kind of an esoteric thing if you're not familiar with it and it's not that well documented. It's at the bottom of the Sparkly R docs, but um, that's like the one main gotcha. But the, the other main functions that you would use, like filter and select and group by and, and all the summarized methods and things like that, that all works really well. And, and the way that that works actually, by the way, is that is that dplyr will generate SQL under the hood. And Spark, Spark's execution engine is a, is a SQL-based engine. It's called um, Catalyst. And the, uh, the way that the Sparkly R and Spark R APIs, the way they both work, is that they, they actually will communicate with that uh, SQL engine and submit those commands. So dplyr generates a SQL statement, and then that gets passed to, um, to Spark itself. How about pivot wider and pivot longer? Um, I'd have to look it up. That's a good question. Uh, uh, if you have further questions about specifics like that, uh, I, I won't call it specifically out who's asking, but definitely reach out to us. Uh, Rafi and Max kind of are 
are experts here, at right. and they are. <laughs> How many times are you going to say R? <laughs> guys who know the most about R. I couldn't fit another one in. All right, let's move on, Rafi. Okay. All right. Let me share my screen here. Um, so, so just before I share this, um, there's when we talk about distributing and scaling R, there, there's like two senses that you could use that term, right? We could mean, oh, let's let's use a package that gives us access to this distributed computing system. That's Spark, and that's what Max just showed you. Um, then there's another sense, though, which is like, well, what if we could take any arbitrary R function and we could scale it out and run it, you know, thousands of times in parallel, and and uh, you know that that would be powerful because then we could take anything from CRAN, any of our R functions that we write, and we could have some uh, system that would allow us to linearly kind of like scale it out. So that's the second sense. And uh, the way that we do that with Spark is with user-defined functions. So let me, uh, let me share that. We're going to go through a quick example of this. Um, you figured is, out a way to distribute user-defined functions from R on Databricks? Well, it, it's, this, isn't, this isn't open source as well. But, but um, everything I'm about to show you is, is possible with, with open source. But I think it's, just, it's a lot easier to do. Um, with Databricks, you'll get up and running a lot faster uh, using Databricks. But yeah, their user-defined functions in Spark are available in, in R, they're available in Python and in Scala, so, and in SQL, actually. Mm -hmm. So very, very powerful uh, pattern. Um, disclaimer, you should try to use the, the native Spark APIs before using user-defined functions. Uh, but if you need to, they're there for you and they can, they can be really effective. So. What I'm going to do in this example here is I'm going to show, um, I'm going to talk briefly about how these user defined functions work. And then I'm going to show how you can use MLflow, which we haven't talked about yet. I'm going to show how you can use MLflow to kind of track all of the execution and results from all of your experiments that are happening in parallel. Okay, so we're going to combine a few things here. Uh, we might have a session another time where we go in deeper, but hopefully this will give you, hopefully this will inspire you in a way. So, like Max was saying, you know, the way that, uh, that the Spark cluster is, is architected is that you have the driver, it submits tasks to the worker nodes. When you're working in the notebook right now and you're using any of these APIs, whether it's just regular dplyr or using Spark R, Sparkly R, you are um, in an R session on the, on the driver node, and then those commands are being submitted out. There's not necessarily any R sessions on the workers at all, okay? But when you use user to, when you use a user defined function, what is happening is you're actually getting an R session on each individual worker. Okay, so uh, th this is what allows you to to take an R function and distribute it across a cluster. The, the the user defined functions in Spark they create that R session for you and they ship your R code over to the workers and then execute it and give you the results back. So let's let's take a look at what that looks like. We'll share the notebooks afterward. I have a table here of, of the various uh, ways that you can do these functions, but um, uh, with, with the two different Spark packages, but uh, it should be, uh, we don't have to go through the details right now. So the way that we're gonna do this experiment is I'm gonna use Max's data set that, that he read into memory already. And then I'm just gonna filter it down a little bit for, for, this, for the sake of expediency to um, data for the month of December. Okay, from 2007, this airline's data set. And then uh, to, get, to show you how MLflow works quickly, I'm gonna collect this back into an R data frame. So the collect function brings data back from uh, Spark to R. Now, what the window that you see here on the right is my tracking server, uh, my MLflow tracking server for this particular experiment, okay? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new run, a new record in my tracking server. And I'm going to train a linear model in R. And I'm just going to log it to the tracking server. Then I'm, I'm using the broom package to scrape all of the metrics from the linear model, like all of the, the R squared and, and the um, adjusted R squared and, and log likelihood, a bunch of other metrics that are already generated when I train the model. And then I'm going to. Um, I'm going to use an L apply to log all of the metrics from this view that I have of, of the model's performance. Okay, Did so you we're going put to auto logging in R 
by yourself? Uh, it's not it's not auto logging, but it, it is. I'm trying to make it faster by by using awesome. L LFI. Um, and then we're going to log the model itself. So so let's do this. And then oh, what happened here? <laughs> All right. The demo demo oh, time. Nice. Okay. Uh, let's see here. I mean, I'm going to try one time to debug. And we'll is see it, if it works. Does it have something to do with you guys swapped clusters and maybe a previous command needs to be run? Um, mm. It shouldn't be. Mm. No, we were using the same cluster, so. Yeah, no. it shouldn't be. An unexpected TOS packet. Yeah, we can try real quick. We can try detaching and detaching and clearing the state. Yep. Let's try this one more time. Oh, need to come back. Um, be an yeah, that will be somewhere up there. Okay, technical difficulties. All good. This might mean that you guys are definitely coming back on to talk more in depth. <laughs> yeah, that should be it. Yeah. No, that's actually the spark clear schema, I think, isn't it? Mm. Cool. Um, okay, we can probably just take this out, actually. Yeah, why not? There you go. Nice Thanks. work. Look at that. Real Look live. That. <laughs> <laughs> this is what we do every day. Exactly. So <laughs> actually I want I want to make sure we get this email. You know, let's do that again. Um, okay. So yep. so now let's try this. Should work now. If not, we'll go on to the next cell. And if that doesn't work, then we've definitely left you on a cliffhanger. <laughs> oh, Rocky. Hey, always look on the bright side. So, but essentially what this is doing is it's going to run that model through, do you have like uh, different hyperparameters or something that it's going to process through and then log all those metrics to the to ML flow? So essentially it's going to run through all those models. So what's, that's where we're going. So the, the, first, the first example here is just training a single model where we're trying to estimate the arrival delay by the departure delay. So I'm gonna come back in here, I'm gonna refresh my, my tracking server and we should see one row. Oh, we have, okay, yeah, here's, here's the row. Let me make this a little wider here. So, um, so here's the row that we just trained, okay? And we logged all of these metrics to this tracking server from, from our training a simple linear model, right? We we're, we're using MLflow, we're piping this data to, uh, to the tracking server. Nice. Now, um, let, me, let me delete all of these. We'll start a little fresh here. And let's look at how we would do this with uh, a user-defined function, okay? So some of this is gonna be kind of similar. We're gonna set the, uh, set the experiment to be this, the same experiment that we're logging to. And the difference is, is that all of the data that we're going to train on all of this arrival and, and departure data, we're going to group the data by the origin airport, and then we're going to apply our training function to each origin airport. So what's happening here is on each of the workers, there's an R session being created that has all the data for a specific airport. And then we're going to apply our, our training function that we just ran on the driver. We're going to apply that to each subset of data in parallel um, on the workers. So you're taking that code out to where the data is on the workers. Exactly. We're right? shipping the code to the data on the workers. This is like That's this paradigm of just distributed computing is what makes, you know, everything so fast. It's, it's always good exactly. to, you know, to, to understand. Yeah. Um, exactly. And don't worry too much about like the, oops, I need to define this one. Don't worry too much about the code in this cell right now. We can walk through that in more detail another time. But um, the main thing is now we have this running and we can refresh the tracking server and we'll see uh, all these results coming in as they happen. So if, if you'll notice the difference here is that we have from all of the workers, there's an R script that's running with our R function and all of the metrics are being piped there and, and, we're, and we're grabbing you know, the model artifacts themselves. Uh, we can come in here and we can compare runs and, and kind of explore the data and things like that. So um, each or, or each origin airport has its own model trained for it. So this is like an exciting, it's a very exciting uh, um, synergy between R, between Spark, between uh, MLflow and, uh, and Databricks. So 
I wanted to kind of end on this note uh, from a technical point of view because I think it's really exciting and, and the, there's lots of really, really cool use cases you can uh, use this pattern for. We've got we've to get going, but I know there's one use case that you've that you wrote about with, uh, with someone. Uh, we're going to take that, and then I have one question I, I, I want to ask, and then I think we're ready for an outro, Karen. So uh, do you want to mention that one use case that I know a lot of us internally love and we share around? Sure, sure. So you're talking about the sports uh, with the twins. Okay, so earlier in uh, 2020, we, we were fortunate enough to, to work with the Minnesota Twins on scaling their uh, pitch, uh, their per player performance pipeline. And uh, the way that they were doing that was they were estimating the, uh, the probability, they were simulating the probability of, of, of where, uh, how a play would turn out based on where a pitch would go. Uh, and, and looking at the X, Y coordinates of the batter's box. So they ran, they wanted to run 300 billion statistical simulations and that was gonna take them two years to run with even like a very, very large VM in the cloud. And using this pattern of user-defined functions, we were able to get it down to like two days. So, uh, you know, th this, has, this had a direct impact on their ability to, um, you know, provide feedback to their players and to help understand which players to retain, which players maybe needed, you know, to go back to the minor leagues, like um, full disclosure, I don't know if they ever made any decisions on that based, based on the work that we did together, but it was definitely something that, that had an impact, um, like a strategic impact on their business. So um, that's a super cool use case and, and there's plenty of others we could talk about another time. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. One last question I wanna ask out there, the Spark VR API works with R RDDs? Uh, I don't, I don't, um, uh, there's like a way you could probably do it, but don't do that. <clears throat> I, good advice. Yeah, it's definitely discouraged. I think I you think, should just stick with the data frame. Yeah, the, I think the maximum of Databricks is, is almost always, if you're doing it with RDDs, you're doing it wrong. Yeah. <laughs> so. That's good to know. Thanks for, thanks for that advice. Uh, and any other words of wisdom, Lee, or, or, Lee, or Rafi or Max? I mean, I, I would just plug that if you want to get started and your company's not using Databricks, there's community edition for you to go out and try as well. So there's there's always a way to go start. Are yeah. you ready, Karen? <laughs> and thank you from the bottom of our hearts. <laughs> go, go ahead, Karen. <laughs> That was awesome, Lee. Yeah, um, thanks so much, Max and Rafi, and for hosting Lee and Franco. Another great session. Um, I, the recording is going to be available on YouTube and we've posted that link in the chat spaces. So I encourage you to check that out as you wish. So with that, thanks everyone for joining and until next time, hope to see you soon. Bye. Thanks everyone. Thank you everyone. Bye-bye. Have a great week. <laughs>